Welcome to Amy Expo East Coast. This is tape 03-543-90. The Amiga from the beginning. Thank you. Welcome to the uh, third and final day of Amy Expo East Coast. It's our first time in Washington, D.C., and it's been really exciting. I've, uh, I've been really overwhelmed by the enthusiasm of, uh, of those people who've been coming to the show. Uh, we do have a, a mandala suite that is uh, cleverly well hidden off the, uh, admin off the atrium where the registration level is. Uh, feel free to go in and play for a bit. Uh, they have a, a revised version of Mandala up and running, and you can play with several musical instruments, uh, play real air guitar, as well as um, doing some body painting and not even get a dab of ink on you. Um, and now let me introduce um, this gentleman who sits over to my right and is well known to, to many of you here. It's quite astounding to me to look back, realize it's been five years since the uh, since I got my machine almost, and which would put the uh, the production cycle for the machine around oh six years ago, uh, and it's still the most far-reaching machine on the market. That's a visionary, and uh, the man who designed that is continues to be one. We were just discussing at breakfast this morning what he's up to now. Well, he's involved in a little pacemaker company that uh, if there's any trouble with the, the pacemaker, it dials the doctor. Um, and not only that, but the doctor can adjust the signal for the heart patient uh, over the phone lines. Again, I think we're talking about a real man of vision here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the father of the Amiga, Jay Minor. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. It's a real honor to have been asked to be your keynote speaker here today. I enjoy attending these uh, Amy Expo shows, and I especially enjoy talking with so many enthusiastic Amiga fans. Uh, he exaggerated a little bit on that introduction. The uh, uh, pacemakers I've been working on don't actually dial the doctor for you. But once you dial the doctor, they do dump information to the doctor so he can know whether you've had any heart problems recently. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with me and my background, I'd like to take a few minutes to describe it. I was one of the two founders of the original Amiga Corporation, and I was in charge of the design of the custom chips in the Amiga. I designed the Agnes chip myself, and I supervised the design of the others and hired the engineers that did them. I was also sometimes vice president of uh, product development for the uh, Amiga computer. I say sometimes because no matter what your title is, you, all, you can't do everything yourself, and compromise is always necessary. And that's one of the subjects of my talk today is compromise. At the Amy Expo show in Germany, a show like this they had in Germany in November, I was asked to give a five-minute talk to the press. Uh, the subject suggested was, what would you like the people, everyone, to know about the Amiga? Well, I did my best, but the time was much too short to cover that subject here uh, at that time. A keynote speech like this one is supposed to be short, but not that short. So I think I will have enough time today to expand on that talk a little bit and describe in more detail what I would most like people to know about the Amiga and what it is that makes this computer so special to me and so many other people. 
First, however, before I get into that, I'd like to give a little bit of Amiga history. Uh, it might help some of you to better appreciate what I'm going to say about the Amiga. Dave Morris and I started the original company called Amiga Corporation back in 1982 in Santa Clara, California, in the center of, of what has since become known as Silicon Valley. At that time, video games were still going up, 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 skyrocketing, actually. And everyone thought that the fast rise would continue. <clears throat> the Amiga company was financed by some wealthy Texans who wanted to cash in on this booming video game industry. They hired Dave Morse, a, a marketing man from Tonka Toys, away from his vi vice presidential uh, marketing position there and made him president of the Amiga Corporation. I was hired from a chip design company called Zymos to design the chips for the Amiga and given the title of vice president of product development. It was President Dave Morse's ambition and intention and that of all of the investors, too, in the original Amiga Corporation to create the best low-cost video game machine in the world. It was my intention to design the most expandable, powerful, and easy-to-use home computer in the world. <laughs> you can see the beginning of conflict right there. I was especially interested in one that could do good flight simulator programs also because I had seen some of the military flight simulators that were being done uh, and uh, thought that something like that, I wanted something like that at home, but I couldn't afford one. They say that engineering is the art of compromise, and I can really attest to that. President Dave Morse and the marketing people were trying very hard to keep the cost down so that they could uh, increase the sales in the uh, video game market. Others, including me, were trying hard to put in features that would increase the perceived value and sales in the computer market. I insisted that even a low-cost game machine should be expandable to a powerful home computer. It was a constant struggle between the cost-cutting gamers and us feature-adding uh, computer types. There were hundreds of compromises made, but I would like to take time to describe only a few of them, just enough to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Internal expansion card slots were vetoed almost from the beginning of the company because the connectors cost about 50 cents each and would require a larger size case. However, after much heated argument, we were allowed to keep one expansion edge connector in the design of the original Amiga 1000. Room inside the case for uh, more floppies and hard disks was also vetoed at first uh, for the same reason. Later, however, after it became obvious that the video game market was in a real slump, to put it mildly, we were allowed to make more of a computer out of it and we were allowed to add one built-in floppy disk. There was a lot of pressure at first to use the 8-bit version of the 68,000 microprocessor. That was called the 68,008 because it was a little cheaper at that time and because it had less pins and a smaller package. It was only 8 bits out instead of uh, 16. We won that battle, I'm happy to say, because later the price of the 68,000 came down to be equal to the 68,008. Almost nobody uses that first one anymore. But we had to give up on the idea of having sockets for future math coprocessors and future memory expansion management units. Because of the socket cost and the space that they required inside the box and their uselessness to video games. The battery backed up clock also had to go for the same reasons. But at least the programmers managed to keep a clock program in the software. We had 512 k bytes of memory on the first working 
Amiga printed circuit board. This was a very easy and natural partitioning of the memory. However, the video games people said that this was too expensive. So the board was completely redesigned and relayed out to hold only 256 K bytes. Later, when it became apparent <coughs> that this wasn't enough memory, a fancy front panel was designed to allow another 256 K bytes to be slapped on the front of the Amiga and purchased separately. These changes really delayed the product uh, release. And by the time it was in production, around 1985, memory prices had come way down, but of course it was too late to change back. This has been one of my biggest aggravations in my entire career as an engineer, is short-sighted marketing people, and I don't know what to do about it. I hope this gives you a better feeling for the origin of the Amiga. It's very much abbreviated. I could spend two hours just on that and how the Amiga computer, the A1000, was full of such compromises. And now I shall concentrate on the subject of this talk, which is, what would I most like people to know about the Amiga? What I would like most for people to know is that in spite of the many arguments and differences we had along the way, and in spite of all those early compromises, both between the president, Dave Morris, and myself as the vice president, and between us and Commodore also. I believe that Dave Morris and I have both finally achieved our goals. The Amiga now has become both the best game machine and the best computer available in its price range. Some claim at any price, but I think they exaggerate a little bit. I would like people to know and to understand that those early compromises I mentioned are now history, having been overcome by Commodore with the introduction of new versions of the Amiga computer. We now have the A500, a cost-reduced version of that early Amiga 1000, with an attached keyboard and external brick power supply on the wall. This machine, I believe, is similar to the video games machine that Dave Morris originally had in mind. However, in spite of its small size, its low price, and its arcade quality games, the A500 is a real computer, able to run all presently available Amiga software. It has a built-in floppy disk and a side expansion connector that allows addition of external hard disks and memory. We also now have the A2000 family of computers. These are basically more expensive versions, more expensive versions of the original A1000, with lots of room inside for more expansion. There is plenty of room and power for two internal floppies, a hard disk and a hard card, and a megabyte of built-in memory. Lots of expansion card slots are also provided. Auto booting from the hard disk is standard now, as is a battery backed up clock. This is almost exactly the computer I had in mind when Amiga was beginning in 1982. In spite of its larger size, professional appearance, and its computing power, the A2000 line of computers will still run all of the arcade quality video games of the A500. High-res color can also be added to the A2000 with the addition of a frame buffer card, sometimes called a flicker fixer, but we don't call it that anymore, right? Uh, makes it sound like something needs fixing. Um, and a, the addition of a frame buffer card and a multi-sync monitor. This makes all the graphics, games, and spreadsheets look much better than the early Amigas. There's another thing I would really like people to know. There's many things, actually. This goes on for a while. Um, the features that make the Amiga a great computer also contribute to its performance as a great games machine. And that the reverse of that is also true. 
Some of the game features are very useful as a, real, as a computing machine. I'd like to go into that subject now for a little bit because this is something else that I want people to know about. For example, the early choice of the 68,000 microprocessor was very important to the Amiga as a personal computer. This choice has helped to give the Amiga superior computing power <coughs> and has allowed continuous user upgrades with the new Motorola microprocessors, such as the 68,020 and the 68,030. These upgrades give the Amiga the speed and processing power of expensive workstations. What is generally not appreciated, however, is that th this processing power can be very important and useful for games and simulations, making them faster and more complex. And guess what? The next generation is in the works. The Motorola 68040 chip will be available on the Amiga real soon now, <laughs> if you know what that means. For those of you who don't know what that means, RSN, or real soon now, is a key word for promises that never happen. But no, it's coming. Uh, Motorola advertisements have put Commodore at the top of their list of the 68,040 developers that are planning to use their computer in, the, in our computer. Something else I would like people to know is that even the least expensive and earliest Amigas, like the A1000, can be upgraded with more memory and some of the advanced microprocessors. They can't all take the 68,030, of course, but 68,020 has a card that will fit inside the A500. In addition, all present Amiga software is compatible with all Amigas, big and small, old and new. I want to repeat that because I think that's one of the most important features of the Amiga. All present Amiga software is compatible with all Amigas, big and small, old and new. Those two features, expandability and software compatibility, are, I think, unique in the personal computer industry and in the game industry, and a big advantage in both of those fields. Yet it isn't even advertised. Another feature people should know about is that all Amigas have the ability to run Macintosh software at full speed with an add-on card, uh, this feature runs even faster than the Mac runs on the Amiga. In addition, the A2000 with a bridge card can run IBM software at full speed inside an Amiga window. This gives the Amiga the largest software base in the entire personal computer industry. This is a fact that almost no one seems to know, except Amiga files. And for some reason, Commodore does not choose to advertise this. People should know about this, and that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm giving this talk. I want you to spread this word. I believe, however, that the best Amiga feature of all is its multitasking operating system. If you haven't used it, it's very difficult to appreciate it. This feature was designed into the very first Amiga, and it is sometimes called true multitasking. This name is used because most multitasking systems uh, are, do not have the Amiga feature of allowing programs to be running truly simultaneously, sharing the microprocessor on a flexible, as-needed, prioritized basis. Amiga programs do not need to know about each other although they can, if they want to, pass messages and share data. Most so-called multitasking systems run each program for a fixed amount of time, whether or not it needs it. Some programs on these systems even require specially programmed versions that are designed to run together. There are other true multitasking systems out there, of course, but from what I hear, they are very buggy and require about four megabytes of RAM memory and the latest model computer to work on. Amiga multitasking, however, is built into the operating system, 
runs on all Amigas and requires only 512 kbytes of memory. This is certainly something that people should know about. As an example of multitasking, while I was composing and writing this speech on my Cygnus Ed professional editor last week, I was also running in the background a, a telephone answering bulletin board system called Skyline. This program sends and receives and displays messages for anyone who dials my computer. Also running at the same time was a third program called Gravity Well. This was simulating a planet with a moon and a spaceship caught in their gravitational forces of each other. It was plotting beautiful three-dimensional color curves, front, top, and side, not ray traced. It was plotting beautiful three-dimensional curves of the orbit of these three bodies, effectively utilizing the time spaces between characters of the editor and my BBS program. Running a fourth program simultaneously called New Screen allowed me to rotate between these displays and see any one of them that I wanted to see. I could also shrink the windows to see them all at the same time running simultaneously. None of these programs bothered each other, even though they were written at different times by different people. They could be independently started and stopped. They could be each had its own pull-down screen with its own independent window uh, its own independent windows, independent screen resolutions, and independent color palette. Can anybody here tell me what other computer at any price can do all of this? Anybody? I don't know of one. So I think we should say, although originally it put me off a little bit, that the, uh, the slogan, only the Amiga makes it possible, is not just an inf empty advertising slogan. There, <coughs> excuse me a second. There are some hardware features of the Amiga that I would like people to know about. Partially because I designed most of them, <laughs> but mostly, mostly because they add to the power of the Amiga as both a games machine and a computer. The Blitter is probably the best known and most famous, but least understood of these hardware features on the custom chips. The term Blitter comes from the initial BLT, which does not stand for bacon, lettuce, and tomato. It stands for block transfer. Uh, it's an old term. This is a hardware logic circuit that does block transfers. Something like a coprocessor that can access display memory and transfer blocks of data around all by itself. This, of course, can also be done by the microprocessor in software, but hardware is generally much faster. The Amiga Blitter, however, does more than just move data around in memory. It can combine color images together. It can fill polygons with selected color patterns, draw lines, and even perform two-dimensional uh, multiplication on two-dimensional arrays. Some say that the blitter has outlived its usefulness since the newer microprocessors, like the, 20, like the 68,000 and 20 and 30, can move data around in memory faster at, when they run at higher frequency, of course. Uh, what they are forgetting is that the blitter is almost like having another microprocessor. It can be working on images while the main microprocessor is off in its separate section of memory doing intensive calculations that only the microprocessor can do. So the blitter has relieved it of the, of the uh, display upkeep, a lot of the display upkeep tasks that, that would have prevented it from doing uh, high-speed computations. Also, as I mentioned earlier, the blitter does much more than just move data around. And as faster Amiga chips come out, and they are being designed, I'll go into that a little bit later, the blitter will get faster too. 
The blitter has obvious use in games because of their graphics and animation, because it moves data around so fast. Not so obvious, though, are its uses in computer applications like window handling, chart making, and instructional and scientific simu uh, animations, and in scientific visualization. I just had to get that word scientific visualizations in here somehow. It's the latest buzzword in computer workstation circles. It's a fancy name for simulations. And the more times you can use it in one paper, the smarter they think you are. I suppose I shouldn't knock the word, though, even though it, it bothers me. If it helps people think of simulations as more than just a flight simulator game. Because simulations can be used for all sorts of scientific uh, studies and understanding. Everything from showing uh, genes and DNA structures in actual rotation and motion to how airplane wings work with the air flowing over the wings, all kinds of scientific applications for simulations. Uh, another important feature of the hardware is the sprites. For those of you that don't know about sprites, these are built into the Amiga. There's eight of them. They are little graphics images with their own little memory that can be preloaded and are independent of the regular bitmap display. These have obvious advantages in games for missiles, rocks, and clubs, and so forth. But their use in computer applications has been neglected, except for pointers. As pointers, sprites are very useful, relieving the computer of the task of extracting the pointer data from the background and replacing it with the original background data, and then inserting the pointer back into the new position while extracting and saving the new background data. In most computers, this must be done every time the pointer moves, even the smallest amount, if you don't have a sprite, which most of them don't. Another great hardware feature of the Amiga is the hold and modify mode. I never appreciated it much until the new hand paint programs like DigiPaint came out. I am hearing a lot of complaints these days, though, about the Amiga's lack of colors compared to the big frame buffer displays advertised for other computers. What I would like to say about that is show me another reasonably priced computer that has built into it over 4,000 colors on screen simultaneously. That's what the hand mode does for us, 4,000 colors with only five bit planes. Other computers require 8-bit planes to do 256 colors. Amiga gives almost 20 times as many colors in half the memory. The Amiga, of course, can also fill up these big high-resolution color frame buffer terminals, or tubes if you want to call them that. There are even transputer boards now for the Amiga that make it uh, able to do ray tracing uh, computations on these huge pictures at an amazing speed. This, all of this, however, is very expensive. Remember, you get what you pay for, except in the case of the Amiga, where you get a little bit more. And I'm not just saying that. I really believe that. Amiga display logic is a very special and unique. Each of the color bit planes has its own pointer to the location of that bit plane in memory. And it can select that bit plane from anywhere in chip memory. This means that the bit planes, which represent the colors of a pixel on the screen, can be easily exchanged with each other simply by changing the value in those pointer registers without reading or writing a single byte of display memory. Turn your tape over at this time for the continuation. And that they use it and the Amiga itself extensively for their preliminary sketches and storyboards. It used to be called Onion. Now I think it's called D the Disney Animator. It uses what I was just talking about, the Amiga bitplane pointers, 
to write to and switch between different intensity animation overlays. And it does this at blinding speed because it can do it without referencing memory at all. Try that on your Sun or your Apollo workstations. Most people know the Amiga has four audio channels with stereo output, but not much else about the Amiga audio. I would like them to know more about it because Amiga audio is very special and very different. These audio channels are not synthesizers. Instead, they are digital waveform players. When required, waveform synthesis, creation of sine waves and, and uh, sounds, can be done by the microprocessor offline. And then these waveforms or notes can be placed in digital memory. These digital waveforms can, of course, represent any instrument or sound. And they can be created by the microprocessor, or they can be digitized off of real life sound examples. Each of these four audio channels has an independent controller, which reads this digitized audio waveform data directly out of memory and sends it to the output on the back of the Amiga computer. Each controller has its own dedicated, independent, high priority DMA time slot so that it, can, it cannot be glitched, that audio from that channel cannot be glitched by other memory accesses, such as the display, the microprocessor, or even other audio channels. This channel controller can read these waveforms as long as 68,000 bytes in memory, automatically. And with a little help from the microprocessor, it can read waveforms of any length in memory. And it can repeat these waveforms automatically over and over again to turn note definition into continuous sound. The processor changes these channel memory pointers to point to the desired notes in memory. So the processor doesn't even have to output this data. All it does is tell the audio channels where the data is located in memory and the audio channel itself as kind of a coprocessor, if you will, reads this data out of memory and sends it out to the, to the speakers. Everyone probably appreciates this need for audio and, and uh, in uh, games and simulations. The monsters coming around the corner in Dungeon Master are a good example that comes to mind. The stereo output of the Amiga is fantastic in a game like that, where the monsters are all over the level of the dungeon that you're on. And with the stereo sound, or with stereo headphones, you can actually tell which direction the monster is coming from. And because there are many channels, you can tell how far, and the volume control of the output of the Amiga, you can tell how far away the monster is. And you, you can hear him coming. You can hear a dragon coming from this direction closer and closer. You can hear a big water monster from this direction coming closer and closer. People appreciate that sort of thing about the Amiga audio once they've listened to it. Uh, but what about business applications? What are the business applications for audio? The Maxi Plan spreadsheet program, for example, uses the Amiga voice synthesis to speak a selected block of numbers so that you can check a column of figures against another column of figures, either in your lap or on the computer, without looking back and forth. The use of speech, speech synthesis in voicemail applications which are coming very soon for the Amiga, fancy voicemail applications, I'm glad to say, and in computer answering machines is also increasing. The Amiga can use either phonemes or digitized speech to talk to the caller or the user. There are many unexplored possibilities for Amiga audio feedback to the computer user. Having had the first good computer audio I will expect you Amiga developers to think of applications to your type of program sooner than those other computer guys. Finally, and to sort of wrap up this little talk, um, afterwards we'll have some question and answer time, I think, I would like people to know what I think Commodore is doing towards the next chipset. I am convinced that Commodore is working on a completely revised set of custom chips for the Amiga and that they are within a year of finishing this task. I believe this 
even though they won't tell me anything. <laughs> Actually, it's better that they don't tell me anything because then I wouldn't be able to speculate like this. When they tell me things, they make me sign non-disclosure agreements. My reasons for believing this are mainly intuitive and based on what I would be doing if I was there now, what I know about the present design of the Amiga, and a lot of a chip design experience in my history. So here are my predictions for whatever you think they're worth. I think the new chips will run at least twice as fast uh, as far as the memory bus is concerned. Uh, maybe even three or four times as fast, depending on what uh, process they can use. And it will put about at least 4,000 colors on the screen simultaneously in standard uh, display mode, 320 by uh, 250 or whatever it is, out of a palette of 64,000. I think that the hold and modify mode will be expanded to 64,000 colors on screen simultaneously. I think the Amiga audio will have twice as many channels and twice the frequency range. I think that the chip memory which is the memory that all of the display coprocessors and audio coprocessors work out of, I think that chip memory range will be increased from one megabyte to eight megabytes in the new custom chipsets. And that the total memory range will be increased from its present eight megabyte limit to the full, I think it's about 4,000 megabytes that the 68,000 is capable of. Oh, wait, I'm not finished. <laughs> Thanks for clapping, though. I, the reason my, usually when I give a talk like this, I take many slaps at Commodore. And if you've heard any of my other talks, you might have been depressed, and I'm sorry for that. But uh, I've been depressed myself a little bit <laughs> until recently. And so uh, because I've seen the uh, 3000 and the 1.4 uh, software release of the new operating system, uh, I think Commodore is doing a great job. And speaking of Commodore, this is another thing I would like to talk about and that I would like people to know, and it's why I'm giving this speech. And yes, this is really the last what I would like people to know item. I am very pleased and excited about what Commodore is still doing to improve the Amiga. I saw the A3000 at the developers conference in Paris and the 1.4 operating system. And I can only say, because of non-disclosure agreements, that they are fantastic. It really is the next generation machine, and when combined with the new operating system, will give the Amiga a professional look and a feel, which it has lacked for a long time. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I'd like to open it to questions now. Uh, any questions at all? Uh, don't don't feel you have to ask questions. You know, I uh, I can always sit down. But if there are any, no. Okay, great. See. You. Oh wait, well, one back here. Yes. At uh, what point did they implement what? What point did the, the question was, at what point in the A1000 did they implement the right protected RAM instead of the ROM? Oh, for Kickstart. For Kickstart. Oh, they didn't do that until the 500 came out. Uh, the uh, A1000 uh, was always RAM. When the A500 came out, I think it was, you want the year and the date, stuff like that? Oh, oh, why is, oh, 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 why was there a kickstart instead of a chipset? Oh, that was done from the very beginning because the operating system was not keeping up with the uh, production of the uh, case and the, uh, and the PC board. Uh, the operating system was falling behind. They had some problems. That's why we ended up with a kind of a weird DOS with all that English BCPL stuff in it. Uh, they had to make some last-minute changes in the operating system. Well, we call them last-minute. 
that was in 1984, uh, that uh, the operating system they wanted to use, I forget what it was now, but they couldn't get it for some reason, so they turned to the English people. And uh, it was all in a state of flux. So they were sure that the operating system was going to be have buggy, buggy and require a lot of changes because they hadn't had time enough. So that was the reason for it. And uh, it was decided very early on then to make it uh, a RAM instead of ROM uh, kickstart. Does that answer your question? Sorry, I didn't understand it at first. Yes, one here in front. Oh, good. We have a microphone now. Just, uh, just something I've been curious about for a while. When you lift the lid on the original Amiga 1000, you look inside and you got all those signatures on yes. there. Uh -huh. uh, there. There's something there that kind of resembles a paw print from some kind of a beast. Is that, is that uh, actually what it is, or is it just something left over from the manufacturing well, process? I wouldn't call her a beast. <laughs> Uh, she's my. She was the Amiga dog. She uh, she worked with me at Atari when I was at Atari. In, in case many, in case any of you don't know, I did a lot of the Atari chips too, computer chips. Um, she worked with me there at Atari every day, and she became very used to going to work with me. And when when we started the Amiga Company Corporation, uh, the president was nice enough to let me bring my dog to work every day. So everybody at the group, but especially R. J. Michaels, uh, loved. Mitchie, the little dog, and uh, gave her tidbits. And every time we came to work in the morning, she'd make the rounds desk to desk to desk, <laughs> getting a love and pet and, and tidbits from everybody. And it started their day off good, too. So her name is Mitchie. She's a cockapoo about this big. She's getting very old now. She's 16 years old, almost blind, uh, very arthritic. She probably won't be with us much longer. And uh, when Mitchie goes, I'll have to have a uh, uh, kind of a wake celebration for her. <laughs> That's her footprint inside there. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, another question. I'm uh, uh, an Amiga user for about three and a half years. I had a 1000 up until two weeks ago when I upgraded to the 2000. Ah. Uh, just moments ago, I bought a 030 card. Oh, great. Uh, now I find out that there's a 3000 on the way with a new chipset. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Can you tell me if uh, if there's any hope that I can catch up with uh, current technology or well, <laughs> what I can tell what I can tell you for sure, and this is not protected by non-disclosure, but I think it will help you, is that I've got two 2000s now, a 2000 and a 2000 HD, and unless I get one for free, a 3000 that is, I plan to stick with the 2000s. Um, my I, my personal opinion is that they're going to be uh, supported for a long, long time, that they will basically do everything the 3000 can do, uh, except maybe, uh, no, they'll probably even do Unix, I would think, because you got the 030 card, you said. Correct. Yeah. So uh, I wouldn't be uh, worried about that at all. When the time does come that the 3000 comes out, I'm sure it'll be more expensive. And if you really want to go that way then, uh, because there will be a few things that the 3000 can do that the 2000 can't, a few minor things. If you want to upgrade, I'm sure you won't have any trouble selling your 2000, so stick with it. One follow-up, uh, without violating any non-disclosure agreements, uh, do you think that the software written for the 3000 and the enhanced chipset will be compatible with the uh, 2000 and, and what... Most of us I, have. I think it will be, and my reason for thinking so is because even though the 4000 has features that the 2000 doesn't, I mean 3000. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Excuse me. <laughs> well, folks, we're in big trouble. <laughs> Just a slip of the tongue, folks. Even though, even though the 3000 has some features the 2000 doesn't, there are enough 2000s out there, and more all the time, especially with this 1000 trade in offer on the 2000. There are enough 2000s out there that I'm sure people will continue to write their software with software switches that allow it to work for either machine. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you had one. Let me see if there's anybody else first. No. Okay. Go. Uh, <laughs> Personally, I don't think they'll have a trade-in like that. I think, and you know, I, I promised I wouldn't take any slaps at Commodore today. But I think they really intend to kill the 1,000 as, as quickly as they can. Their reasons for doing so are many. 
uh, only one of which, and I'm not saying it's the primary reason, but I think it's a reason, is that our signatures and that of my dog is on the inside cover of the 1,000. <laughs> Well, it's not exactly that those signatures are there. It's the, the whole not invented here syndrome. Westchester did the 500 and finished the 2000. Uh, Commodore Germany started the 2000. None of them really had anything to do with the 1000. So let's kill it. <laughs> uh, another question here. Yeah. You suggested that the speed of the chipset could easily go to three or four times what it well, easily two, easily two, maybe three or four. Okay, um, doing that, it would be feasible to uh, have a 24-bit plane system, at least in the lower resolutions. Is there any reason why you could uh, foresee not going with 24 bits, since that seems to be what most of the people are standardizing on? Well, there's no reason. Not, you, you can do 24 bits now if you want to build a big frame buffer. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the way people do it. That's the way the other computers work. They have these big color frame buffers that are impossibly slow to manipulate in, but great for slowly building up uh, uh, beautiful pictures that you can put in magazines and and di and digitize into uh, into animations, video animations. With a 25 megahertz chipset, though, you should be able to do that extremely quickly on an Amiga. Uh, in fact, it should um, outrun a Tiga. Those big chipset. memories are always much slower than the small memories, mm -hmm. and uh, also a lot more, always a lot more expensive. So. Uh, I'm sure things like 24-bit uh, planes will not be built into any near future Amigas, but uh, the ability to drive external uh, buffers like they have for the Mac, these tubes with built-in mm -hmm. frame buffers, uh, will probably be there. Thank Does you. that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. That uh, partly covers my question, but uh, what I wanted to ask you for a long time, you keep hearing of uh, special purpose uh, graphics uh, processor chips under development with uh, horrendous power. And to what extent is the unique position of the Amiga vulnerable to being uh, at least me too by uh, progress in these, uh, these areas? It's definitely vulnerable. It's uh, vulnerable. Uh, it's always a problem when you come out with a machine is backward compatibility. And uh, IBM has, been, has, has had that albatross around its neck for a long time now, backward compatibility, and has cost them in future developments. And it happens to every company that gets into this business. The, the, the technology moves so fast. Uh, but what you can do, and what will happen, I think, with, uh, and is happening with uh, IBM, is that uh, you can maintain backwards compatibility by keeping the uh, present chipset and, and future versions of that chipset, keeping them in there and adding new processor architecture around it. Like I understand people are now uh, working on a version of the Texas Instrument uh, frame buffer display handler card for the Amiga. Uh, that's an example of, of a microprocessor that is dedicated to display that is separate from the core Amiga, which is backward software compatible. And I think you'll see that in almost all of the older computers, such as the Amiga and the uh, Mac and the Atari and the IBM. Uh, you'll see that in all of those. And as new companies start up to make new computers based on the new technology and the new cost of RAMs and the new density of integration, as these companies come along, they put those older companies in a bad position. And eventually, the older companies have to say, the heck with it. At this point, we got to, it's more important to be competitive than it is to be backwards compatible. And at that point, and only then, is when these new companies will come out with this new technology. That's the most I can say. OK, I don't see any more. So, oh, here's one back there. Yes. Oh, I don't tell it as well as he does, <coughs> but, uh, oh, well, let me touch on both of them a little bit, because there's probably people here that don't know about them. The Joe Pillow uh, episode that Michael, that R.J. Michaels likes to do, it resulted from a plane ride where he and Dave Needle were uh, escorting the Amiga, the first Amiga uh, uh, simulated, uh, simulation, breadboard, if you will, of the Amiga computer, they were escorting it on the airplane 
back to the computer show, CES show in Las Vegas. So because it was so big and so fragile, they bought a, a, a ticket for it on the chair between the two of them. And they set it there. And the lady was coming with the dinner, the food. And they were starved. And they wanted to get some more. So they put this pillow on top of this big box. They put a coat over the pillow. And they painted eyes on the face. And they, they put the, uh, the table on the, the table in front of you on the airplane. They put it down in front of the guy. And they tried to get the uh, stewardess to leave an extra dinner. <laughs> At least that's the way I heard the Joe Pillow story. Uh, the uh, Dancing Fools. The, the way I heard the Dancing Fool story was that uh, R.J. Michael and uh, Dale Luck uh, were doing programming in the back room of the early Amiga offices, if you will. It's kind of like a dark, dank cell back there. And they had these chairs where you sit with your, you're practically sitting on your knees in this chair. You're, slot, you're kind of forward like this. It's supposed to be better for the back or the knees or something. But it put them in almost a uh, meditation position. And they'd start their computer compiler runs. <coughs> of course, Lattice didn't have anything for the Amiga back then. Uh, Manx had some uh, C compilers for the Amiga, as did a couple of other early companies. Uh, and so while the, while the compiler was trying to compile their latest revision of the software, there wasn't much for them to do except to sit there and, uh, and meditate. But then, and that's where the uh, guru meditation number came from. But then when they got tired of meditating, uh, they would get up and they would dance between while well, the machine was compiling to exercise their legs that wouldn't go to sleep. They would dance around and they, they learned to do some of these Amiga dances that they did later um, for the uh, company uh, Christmas party and things like that. <laughs> they got four of them in top hats and, and everything. Dave Needle, R.J. Michael, Dale Luck, and um, I forget who the fourth one was. In, ah, in top hats and tails to demonstrate these dances for us at the uh, Mega Christmas party. And so they became known as the Dancing Fools. Well, oh, here's one back here. How are you doing on time? Anybody know? You still have some time for more questions? Uh, that guy back there was first. Uh, can you uh, stand up and shout? Did you hear him? Can you relay that? Come to the mic. Oh, oh, uh, ham, right. Hold and modify mode. Well, the, originally the hold and modify mode on the Amiga was intended for NTSC. And uh, we had an NTSC converter, a, uh, a little transistorized one, right on the custom chip uh, because it was video game oriented. Then later on when uh, video games started to slump, uh, Commodore said, oh, you can take that off now. We're going to have an external uh, NTSC converter that's much better. And... Uh, but the hold and modify mode there, which was built to handle hue, saturation, and intensity fields, uh, I asked them to take that off too. But the, lay the chip layout people said, no, no. If we take that off of the chip, it'll leave a big hole there, and it'll look real funny. <laughs> <laughs> seriously. Seriously. He said, we don't want to take it off. He said, if you don't want to use it, that's fine. I said, OK, I'll get the software people to leave it out of the manual, and nobody will even know it's there. Well, they snuck it into the manual anyway. And uh, luckily, they did, because now we have uh, all of the hold and modify paint programs and everything that I never dreamed would ever be invented. Uh, does that answer your question? OK, uh, this guy is next here. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask, uh, would you contrast the Fat Agnes chip, your design, in terms of its future capability to stay uh, competitive, if you really think it can, compare it and contrast it to, say, the 34010, the TI chip. And uh, it may be a little bit far out, because I think it's not quite uh, the same type of chip, but the IE60 that's recently come to the forefront. And can you give us any kind of a prognostication in terms of whether you think the Fat Agnes can be continued to live into the future? Well, or if there's going to be something okay. more. And then one more final question. Well, let me, let me address that one okay. first, Go ahead. Uh, because I might forget so, stuff going through my head already. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's a matter of competition so much because these other chips can also be added to the Amiga. There's nothing to stop you from putting them on the memory bus and having cards and things that work around them. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of competition. It's a matter of how long do you need to be backward software compatible. And I think the Amiga chips will, for that reason, 
be around for a long time in either the present form or more likely the upgraded versions that I referred to earlier. Does that answer your first question? Yes. Okay. Second question is, and it's more of an opinionated question, I think, and that is, uh, um, what do you see if you can give us any of your insights as a uh, way for Commodore to more educate the mediocre PC buying public to ex to uh, <laughs> to appreciate the Amiga and buy them instead? I think they can take this thing right here that we're making right now and put it on every TV station in the country. That's what I think they can do. Now, there's one other thing. There's one other thing. I'm trying to start, and I almost forgot to mention this. I've been mentioning it every time I go to an Amiga users group, which is frequently lately. I'm starting a ca campaign that we've got to publicize the Amiga ourselves in the following way. You all have subscriptions or buy these Amiga magazines at your newsstand. And after a while, they're coming out of your ears at home. Take them to your doctor's office. Take them to your dentist's office. <laughs> Leave them there. And more importantly, listen, listen now. It doesn't matter whether they give you any money for them or not. Sneak them onto your newsstands at your local newsstand. <laughs> Seriously. Take, so, take them in under your coat if you have to. <laughs> and stick them on the shelves everywhere you go. Call it J Miner's campaign to stick them on the shelves. OK. Uh, is it possible to build a 1,200 by 1,000 ham display mode? And would it be cost effective? Standard 4,096. Oh. <laughs> yes, it's possible. It would be. I any kind of uh, resolution like that, even in hand mode, requires a lot of memory. And it would be expensive. But it wouldn't be as expensive uh, as the 24-bit. No, bit. no. no. Uh, in hand mode, you always get big advantages. There is a uh, product that's being developed now by a company called Black Belt Systems that does a external hand mode um, that has that kind of, uh, of colors, but it doesn't have that resolution. OK? Next. Oh, we got a lineup finally. Good. Um, I'm an engineer, and I've been using Amiga for the last year in hardware development of missile design. Yes, wonderful. It is a superb development system for doing hardware development. And you hardly hear any mention of that anywhere. It would have taken several, three, three or four IBMs. Some of my hardcore IBM programmers after they got on Amiga said that to do what we did. We controlled $150,000 rate tables. We uh, digitized at, at a very high rate, 10 bits, 40 megahertz, that sort of thing. Bring it in the buffer. The Amiga, the multitasking allowed us to demonstrate different pieces of the system long before we had a complete uh, software package to, to uh, demonstrate it. Do you have any software packages that uh, help you do this that uh, you might consider having published someday? someday? Well, everything was ad hoc to what we were doing. We used Lattice 5.04, and uh, we, we just uh, put the pieces together as we needed them. But it's, it's, the idea is it's not meant to be uh, generated for just everyone. It's uh, an industrial, proprietary type situation. Would you, would you be willing to uh, help make a, a Commodore ad for uh, the Amiga by contributing your knowledge in this area? Well, if it was appropriate, surely. <coughs> Something that isn't classified, of course. Certainly. <laughs> uh, would you see me after the show, and I'll give you my card and try and get you together with somebody from Commodore. Fine. Have you kept track of the original uh, Amiga development people, and, and do you know what they're doing now? Um, I've kept track of most of them, and uh, this is partly why I believe that the Commodore is working on this chip, uh, really advanced chipset I was talking about, because some of them have gone back to work for Commodore. And uh, others I haven't heard from in uh, two or three months, but uh, and some I haven't heard from in years. But most of them, yes, I've kept track of. And uh, if you ever need to get in touch with somebody, uh, I might be able to find them for you. I uh, want to add to your arsenal of uh, promotion techniques. Oh, great. Uh, I want to suggest that the most important technique is to find 10 minutes of uninterrupted, concentrated study time for people who make purchasing decisions. And the best way to do that is to take magazines, as you suggest, and leave them in the executive washroom. Executive washroom. Executive washroom. There you go. A very short question, not as technically oriented, but why a Boeing bomb? <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, I was wondering if you could maybe take 30 seconds to explain why the red and white checkered ball as opposed to anything else. Is there something behind that or is there something that came off the top of somebody's head? Um, I, I know where it was done, I know when it was done, and that is partly the why, but what triggered it in their minds, I don't know. It was done at the CES show in Las Vegas while they were trying to dream up that we had time to just barely time to get the breadboard finished to take the Welcome to the Amy Expo Conference in Washington, D.C. This is tape 03-543-90, the continuation of the presentation by Jay Minor. <laughs> Actually, I don't have an observation on that other than the fact that, uh, is that considered a trademarkable item? Because I have seen that being used. They have used. stopped Atari from using it now. Uh, they haven't stopped Apple. They, have, they haven't stopped Apple? I've seen uh, companies that develop strictly for Apple software using that uh, in animation programs and things like that. I assume they're just stealing items off the Amiga and then porting it to the Mac. Just I would suggest sending, if you can get a copy of such uh, tape or ad, send it to Commodore because I think, it's, I think it does have copyright uh, protection now. Okay. Uh, okay. Because I, I, I'm almost sure they stopped Apple from, uh, stopped Atari from using it anymore. Just very quickly, there are several IBM demos there. There are several public IBM demos that are using that. I've seen them at trade shows and swap meets where they just people are using them to hawk the 386 boxes. So. Well, again, if you see any of those bouncing balls around on other people's machines, try and get a, a picture of it or, or a disc of it or something and send it to Commodore. I'm another one of the uh, diehard folks who can't get enough of history about Amiga. Uh -huh, good. So it's the question of why Amiga as a name, uh, being the feminine Spanish for friend, okay. and of course Agnes, Paula, and Denise, which I also vaguely remember had different names. Okay. You could shed a little history there. Okay. Uh, anybody else interested in this? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to be sure. You know, sometimes all my previous talks I've gone more into Amiga history than I did today. And so a lot, I assumed a lot of people were burned down on it. You trying to interrupt? Uh, yeah, just uh, a little, little background on that bouncing ball. I don't know why the ball, oh, but the, uh, the sound effects oh, were created sound by effect. Bob Pariso uh, banging a wiffle bat against his uh, garage door. So if anybody wants to know where that came from, that, that's, that's He's what right. it is. He's right about that. I forgot to mention that. Bob Pariso, they were looking for a sound that would sound like that ball bouncing. So that we had this steel door that went up and down in the back of the early Amiga office. And he got this baseball bat and banged on that door and then recorded it, digitized it. And that's where that came from. Um, get me started again on yours. Uh, oh, OK. Uh, Amiga and the chip names. Amiga was dreamed up by uh, Dave Morris and the investors. Uh, at first, the company was called High Toro, believe it or not. <laughs> And I, I said, hey, that sounds like somebody bullfighting with a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think, I think that's why it's not called High Toro today, because <laughs> that kind of wounded, I think that kind of wounded our president. Uh, but they changed the, num they changed the name at that point in time. And uh, I, later on, I asked him about it. And it seems that uh, uh, they wanted something that would resemble a friendly computer. Well, amic is the Latin root for friendliness. Amy, amic, amicable, amicable is the Latin root for friendliness. And, but they wanted something short that sounded like Atari. So uh, they took Amy and put uh, G on the end of it. Uh, I, as near as I can tell, because when I questioned them, they said, no, we don't, didn't know it was uh, female for Spanish. Right. <clears throat> I said, well, you, you know, that might... It means, in the certain parts of the United States, it means more than girlfriend. It has other <laughs> connotations in, in the Spanish language. And um, I said, uh, you might lose a lot. And because it's simply because it's Spanish, you might lose a lot of the market in the Southwest in places uh, where there's a lot. The only people that would buy it are not the uh, people of Spanish origin, but the uh, people with money. You might lose a lot of that market with a Spanish name, and he said he didn't think so, and so. That, that takes care of Amiga, I think, at least as much as I know of it. As far as the chip names are concerned, 
I did name those. Um, Agnes, I wanted to have something, the, 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 that chip handles all of the address generation for all of the DMA channels in the Amiga system. And address generation was its most important function. So I wanted something that would remind us all of that as we created this thing. So I wanted a word that began with AG for address generation. And I looked through the dictionary and the first one I could find that uh, was halfway decent was uh, Agnes, and A-G-N-U-S I think it's spelled. And it was defined as the Lamb of God. And I said, that's it, the Lamb of God. <laughs> If anything is going to be, uh, uh, at that time it was one of the most uh, intricate and large uh, chips that were around. Uh, and the, the other names, uh, the D names, I think it was a, there was a, a Daphne for a while and, a Denise, and then a Denise. Uh, the D stands for uh, data, display data. And uh, Paula, Portia, those kind of names with a P were for ports and audio. Paula, ports and audio, because that was their function. And again, we would take, try and take what was on, to name the chips, I would try and take what was on the chips uh, with letter abbreviations for it and try and expand that if I could into, into a girl's name or uh, some kind of name that would be easy to remember. Oh Gary. oh, Gary was done recently by Westchester and that just stands for Gatorade. Because they were done not custom by hand, they were done with one of these standard cell placement uh, gate array things. Uh, technique for making chips these days, gate arrays. That's where Gary came from. How am I doing, what time is it? Anybody know what time it is? I think we've got somebody else coming in here at one o'clock. So let's call it again. Let's see you at the show. Thanks for all the questions. This presentation is now completed. It was presented at Amy Expo East Coast. Produced by Audio Transcripts Limited of Alexandria, Virginia. For additional tapes, call toll-free 1-800-338-2111. Thank you.